Uh, tonight, we're going to be uh, taking a special opportunity of uh, having a friend that's in town. He's been uh, working last two days in uh, studios here in, in the Southland. Uh, but normally, you guys know that normally Tony Perkins is embedded on, in the East Coast, uh, certainly the city of Washington, D.C. I've known Tony for many, many years. For those of you who are not aware, Tony Perkins is the longest uh, running uh, president of the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. It is the nation's largest and most powerful uh, Christian voice to the nation regarding faith, family, and freedom. What they do is they stand for that trinity of truth uh, and they defend that ability of yours, all wrapped up in the First Amendment, if you think about it, uh, to our state leaders uh, across these 50 states and, of course, to our national leaders in Washington. It's pretty amazing when a national leader uh, would even contact Tony Perkins to ask, what is the Judeo-Christian worldview position on this particular issue? And that's, that's a pretty amazing thing when our nation's leaders contact Tony to ask, what will the Christian uh, community think about this policy that the party or that I'm or that our state might be thinking of? And that's, listen, that is very, very, in my opinion, very much like uh, the king summoning maybe Isaiah into the court to ask questions, what would God think of this? And we love that. And if you're new to this church, we do not see a separation of our, our Christian witness in any areas of life. We believe that our Christian witness is to shine everywhere. And so before I have them come out, I want to prime tonight uh, by giving you these, these verses. I want you to be thinking about tonight, because we're going to be talking tonight about critical race theory. We're going to be talking tonight about BLM. We're going to be talking about Antifa. We're going to be talking tonight about socialism and how, how we respond to this stuff as Christians. Where are the origins of these things? And how do we conduct ourselves as a church and as a community in letting our light shine in this age. And so we hope that this will be very beneficial. So the Bible tells us, Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20, and I'm curious if you have your Bibles, you'll follow that with me because there's a little bit of a, a change in a word that is most crystal clear in the old King James. The old King James nailed it. But 1 Timothy 6 20 says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and vain babblings and contradictions on Facebook, Twitter, and... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> of what is falsely called science in the Old King James. Anybody have an Old King James version? Look at the word. It says science. That is awesome. Avoid profane and vain babblings that people put out as science, or the new renderings of your Bibles use the word knowledge. Did you know that there can be a profane knowledge out there? You ever think about that? Have you ever thought that there can be vain knowledge and babblings, which, are, which is inverted knowledge or knowledge that is actually propaganda that has nothing to do with the truth? Do keep that in mind, because that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Where does it come from? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in the latter times, the last days, the days in which you and I are living in right now, that some will depart from the faith. Why will they depart from the faith? Because look, giving heed to deceiving spirits, these are demonic, fallen angelic, deception, and doctrines of demons. Verse 2 says, speaking lies and hypocrisy. The Bible says that in the last days, deception is going to increase, but the source of this stuff and vain babblings and idleness of mind will come from demonic spirits propagating and promoting doctrines of demons. So you want to ask the question, in what areas will they 
propagate? Where, what areas of life will doctrines of demons infiltrate and this, these aberrant teachings go? And the answer is everywhere. It's not just in wayward churches or cults. It's in politics. It's in schools. It's in families. It's everywhere where demonic activity can gain an ear. And the Bible says, watch out to be very careful for us to ward this off. And then finally, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, but know this. It's a strong word. Paul says, basically, you ought to know this. Or like the commercial says, everybody knows this, right? You can save 15% on your insurance in 15 minutes, and everybody knows this. Do I have the right commercial? Doesn't matter. It's like, hey, everybody knows this. Well, Paul is saying, excuse me, but everybody knows this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Ask yourself, is that happening? Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, <laughs> haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What a huge statement that is. So we're going to be talking about these things tonight, and uh, we hope to go through these things enough to where we can open up uh, some uh, Q&A with us this evening, with you. And so without any further ado, Tony Perkins, he has served the United States uh, as a U.S. Marine, as a police officer, as an elected official to the Louisiana State Legislature, uh, again, a, a counselor and a, guide, a guidance uh, tool by God to our nation's leaders, and um, he's a remarkable man. I love him, his family, and um, he is, for those of you men who were here at our Stand Courageous conference that Tony hosted here, uh, we all were introduced to having a battle buddy, and uh, Tony, I'm proud to announce, is my battle buddy. He's, uh, when, when I need love, support, rebuke, strengthen, encouragement, prayer, uh, I, get, I just have Tony on speed dial. And every man, every woman, you should have a woman in your life if you're a woman. That is your, your battle, battle. You know what I'm saying? And all of us guys should have a battle buddy. Give a warm welcome to Tony Perkins. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Great to be with you. Thank you. Good to be home. As and I, I think I think that's a battle buddyette, isn't it? But buttette. But okay. So Tony, he's been working all day in media, yeah, so you I'm, have to excuse I'm, I'm, I'm in a suit. For, I know that no, I'm afraid they're going to cut my tie off, but it's a good tie, so please don't. Yep. So, um, listen, he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt or something That's casual right. in spirit. That's but, right. um, but you guys also want to encourage all of you. Tony Perkins uh, authored a book called No Fear, Real Stories of, courageous, of a Courageous New Generation Standing for Truth. And um, I encourage you to get your hands on this. But, Tony, how do they get their hands on this? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some outside. Do you really? I think. And where would that be? Do we know? Does anybody know where that is? In the foyer? In the foyer? Fantastic. Okay, very, very good. Ask. Okay, let's, let's uh, dive into this. So, um, Are we standing? The, we can stand or we can do anything right. we want. That's why they're we, here. We can, we can sit, we can stand. Stand. Um, Ephesians 6. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so all around the world today, around the world, it's not limited to the United States, there is this ever-increasing dialogue, Tony, regarding critical race theory. Um, we want to talk about that. I know that you uh, deal with that a lot in conversations. Uh, introduce to us what is critical race theory and why is it so dangerous? 
Well, let's, I want to I expand upon what you were just sharing a little bit about earlier, what Paul wrote. I want to go to Colossians, what Paul wrote to the believers uh, there in that he said this, he said, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, our starting point always has to be Scripture. And, and Paul was warning believers back then, and it's even more so now, as you were talking about the latter days and what the end times are going to be like, that there are those that are intentionally trying to deceive using the traditions of man denying what is in Christ. And that is exactly what critical race theory is, but more broadly, it is the woke movement. It, it, it's more than just critical race theory. It is a deconstruction of Western civilization. It is a deconstruction of our republic. It's a deconstruction of the Christian faith. It is a deconstruction of basic human biology as we see in our schools today where this transgender philosophy is is all a part of this wokeness because it is intimidating people into silence it is like the emperor has no clothes but people are afraid to speak mm -hmm. and you have to understand that the, the blm marxism for it to take root and to prosper it has to eradicate faith christian faith because the two are like oil and water, they're incompatible. And so that's why you see this increased hostility, resistance toward, and opposition to traditional biblical faith. Now, we talk, I'm not going to use the term Christianity, because Christianity has become mm -hmm. like silly putty. Right. Uh, you can stretch it into anything you want it to be. We want to talk about followers of Jesus Christ. We want to talk about biblical Christianity. Right on. Because as a follower of Christ, yeah. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. You see, Jesus did not come to this earth to affirm us in our sin. He came to save us from our sin. Yeah. And in fact, just today, uh, Pastor Jack, I'm getting off. I'm not going to chase any rabbits, but I'm going to kind of lay the foundation for this. Just today, we're, you know, in June, and this is uh, Gay Pride Month, and there was a letter f written in, uh, it was op-ed in the Army Times, that was published, I think, just today or maybe yesterday, from a military chaplain, an Army chaplain, basically calling to task the military to remove chaplains who refuse to affirm LGBTQ soldiers. So follow the logic there. If you do that, and this administration, I think, is more than happy to do that, if you do that, you would have to remove every chaplain from the military that believes right. the word of God. So it, we're living in a day where you have to choose either the yes. word of God or the traditions of man. The, as you were talking about, the, the, the vain, evil babbling. knowledge, the babbling, the yeah. science that they create. It's interesting, we're the ones accused of not following the science, and I don't have any trouble distinguishing between male and female. <laughs> this is all a part of it, and in this confusion rushes in this Marxist ideology of critical race theory. Now, in fact, I just did a program, uh, our, our weekly Pray Vote Stand, we just, uh, just did that just about an hour and a half ago. And it was focused t t tonight on this issue of critical race theory. It is throughout education in America. Yep. Now, you're always on alert because you live in California, and every wacky idea originates out here. <laughs> and politician. <laughs> yeah. Now, but here's what's happening. There are many red states, red areas, where this critical race theory is right under the noses of parents and they didn't even know it. Now, the silver lining, one of the silver linings to the coronavirus is that parents whose kids That's were at right. home because the teachers didn't want to teach. Um, no, I mean, look, the unions, there's a lot of teachers that wanted to teach, but the unions yes. wouldn't let them go back. And, and so parents got a, a f I mean, they got more than they wanted to know what the children That's are right. being taught. And so parents are pulling their kids out of public schools in record numbers. In droves. Now, post-COVID, yeah. right. exactly, homeschooling is exploding across the nation. 
I was just talking with the Attorney General of Indiana, Todd Rokita, and he led about 19 other attorney, attorneys general writing a letter to the Biden administration uh, that they're going to fight this critical race theory that's being pushed through the Department of Education. Right on. And I asked him, I said, uh, and he had previously served in Congress and actually had been the chairman, I, I believe he was the chairman, a ranking member of the House Education Committee. And so he's very familiar with the Department of Education. He's familiar with all that. And I asked him, I said, uh, General, what, it, looking at the timeline of, hu of this country, human history, where we are right now, and the critical nature of this moment, how critical is it? He said, it is, he said, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't want to overstate it, but he said, I think this is one of the most critical moments in the history of this country. Yeah, absolutely. Because there are those that want to redefine who we are, and they're trying to scare you and I into silence. And here's where we have to be. We have to stand on the word of God and say we will not be That's silent. It. That's right. We will not shrink back That's in the right. shadows. We will proclaim the truth. Well, Tony, here's the amazing thing of what you're saying about standing. Somebody who has a different worldview will say, there you go, you Christians, you know, uh, you're, 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 you're completely detached from reality and you're judging me and you're condemning me. No, not at all. Taking a stand is the only way to rescue people that are going down a path of total destruction. And it's so total that part of that total destruction is that they don't see themselves going down that, that path. You say, well, who makes, who makes the Christian the authority? We, it's not us. It's the authority of this book, right. the Word of God. He knows what's best. And exactly as we're talking about in, open, in reading these scriptures in the opening... Ask yourself this question. If you don't think these things that we're talking about are serious, are we living in the last days? Well, what, character, what characterizes the last days? I didn't mention the part that Jesus warned us that there'd be an increase in violence, lawlessness. All those things are written in the book to announce to us how to discern the times and the seasons. And when, when you mention critical race theory, that's an indicator announcing to us that darkness is advancing and it's so close to taking over. It really is. But what's tough about us in the West is that we somehow don't think, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go so far and then it's going to come back. It's like a wave. It's going to go, but then the wave has to surrender to the shore. Listen, that's not what the Bible talks about. In the midst of advancing darkness and evil, those scriptures command us to stand up against it doesn't mean you have to be ugly and mean about stuff, but it does mean that you be truthful about it. And without us speaking the truth in love to those who are actually seeking to silence us, they don't know it, but they're writing their own death sentence by telling us to be quiet because we're the only ones with the answer. Right. And that's not arrogance. Our answer is the Bible. They need it. They don't see that. But evil is going to advance. It's going to keep advancing. The question is, what will you do as a believer? And it's not a group response. It's not group think. That's an individual answer for all of us. And we're living at a time, you know, where every, every true follower of Jesus Christ is going to be tested. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus warned us when he called his disciples, you know, he said, look, they hated me, they're going to hate you. I mean, what a, what a, what a great, uh, <laughs> I mean, locker room pup talk. <laughs> yeah. Hey, welcome to the team. <laughs> but, you know, he said that. He said, because why? Because I don't want you to lose your joy. Mm. Wait. That's you mean amazing. people are going to hate me and I'm still going to be joyful about it? <laughs> Look, he's told us all of this. And here's the biggest challenge. This is why I'm so grateful for my brother Jack and for Calvary Chapel and other pastors like this. Uh, that are preaching the word of God because what every time he opens this word he's preparing you mm -hmm. and this is the only way that we can stand in this day is standing on the word of God and it's not my opinion as Jack said it's not our opinion mm -hmm. it's the word of God it's the truth of God and what is our mission our mission is to stand firm on this truth why because Jesus said it is the truth that will make you free and so as you and I become billboards for the truth, those that are locked in the bondage of death and deceit 
will be set free, many of them, simply because you and I are faithful to live out the truth with joy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want, I want to underscore that, that even as things are becoming dark and darker, that shouldn't surprise That's us. Right. Jesus said it was going to happen. But here's the thing. It's like the parable of the wheat and the tares. You know, they wanted to pull up the tares, the weeds. Um, and Jesus said, the, the master said, no, don't do that. Wait, let them grow, both grow, and then we'll be able to discern the difference. And then we will pull out the weeds and mm -hmm. we'll reap the harvest. The point is, he said, this is like the latter days. The evil is going to be very pronounced, but here's something else. The good is going to be pronounced yeah. as well. This, and you're seeing this, Pastor Jack, yeah. you've seen it over the last year, almost year and a half, the good that has come out with the number of people that have come through these doors, have heard the gospel here and on the internet and in the airwaves, and have accepted Jesus Christ yeah. as their Lord and Savior. This has been a dark time, but the light has shone bright through the word of God here at yeah. Calvary Chapel. Yeah, so true. So true. So let's dive into this. Um, just respond. Um, when, you, when you hear critical race theory, uh, just shout out what comes to your mind when you hear it. Be it news. What's that? Okay, evil. What else? Be more, more descriptive. Lies. What else? Okay, I'm hearing very good spiritual responses, but give me a more uh, of, a, of a... There it is. She said it. Racism. Okay, Racism, when you hear critical race theory, racism, what color race are you thinking when you hear this? White, per perfect answers, black and white. When you hear of critical race theory, do you think of Asians? Do you think of uh, Pacific Rim? Do you think of uh, Eastern Europeans or South Americans? You don't, you don't. I wanna submit to you tonight that this is a well-engineered, a well-orchestrated, uh, long-sought-after agenda. This is not a momentary fad. This is something that a, a particular group of, of people in a particular worldview have come to know this works. Divide the races and get them to turn on each other and then we will come in and offer a solution. This is textbook. Some of you might be picking up on where I'm going. There is a direct correlation between critical race theory and BLM. You say, well, duh. Well, wait a minute. Think for a moment. There's a direct correlation, critical race theory and the BLM movement. There's a, there's a, there's a direct correlation to Antifa. There is a direct correlation between Marxism, socialism. This is a long agenda that is now, the toothpaste is out of the tube now. And it's so much out of the tube and out there that behind it all, peel back history, the pages, there is a particular worldview that has exploited what you think is just a momentary fad. And that is the advancement of radical Islam. You say, how can you say that? I have to say it because it's historically accurate. Do you know anything about the Grand Mufti and Adolf Hitler? What do you know about the, the Nazis' agenda and how it correlated with the Muslim Brotherhood that was born out of North North Africa and Egypt. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever looked at the similarities? Behind it all, the reason why the Grand Mufti was given the authority of a panzer division, a Muslim cleric under Adolf Hitler, was because Hitler agreed with the racism of the Muslim Brotherhood. Today, all across America, Christianity's out, Islam's okay. Now, you might be a Muslim here tonight, and you might be thinking, I never heard about that. I never even thought about that. Well, to, to your credit, you're not a fully committed Muslim then. Because what I'm saying to you, Middle Eastern Islam 
They already know this. Behind the riots in the streets, in fact, listen, I'll be quiet in a moment when I give you this picture. Notice how it almost appears that this last summer of 2020 and what happened in our streets in America was warm up or a, a um, example of what racism can do under Islamic influence because we just saw it in the last few weeks in Israel. Never before has there ever been street to street, house to house rioting and killing and attacking among Muslim citizen and Jewish citizen in Israel until now. Why? We showed them on our streets last summer. This is an agenda driven by radical Islam. And behind the scenes, you'll see more and more of this surfacing. There'll be more and more attack against Jews, more and more attack against Christians, and you'll see an elevation of Islamic doctrines, even if they are repackaged and remodeled. Why? Doctrines of demons. It's an amazing time in which we're in. Keep, it, keep your eye on that. That's why AOC and her team are so vocal. That's why they're so popular. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, my goodness, Muslim Brotherhood, Antifa, and hybrid warfare to destabilize America. This is a July 20th, um, 2020 news, and this is only increasing. From defund the police to defund Israel movement. One and the same group. The same group, groups saying, let's defund the police, are now saying, let's defund Israel. Do you know anything about Islam? Israel cannot exist in Islam. Are you putting the pieces together? Pomona College student government passes resolution to defund clubs supporting Israel. What's going on? Biden's America. Riots, protests hit Minnesota, Portland, Chicago, Oakland, and Northern California. Or North Carolina, sorry. This is April 17th, 2021. Do you see the correlation? You say, Jack, I can't believe you're saying that. That's the problem. Right. Do you feel it? Do you feel it? You don't say that because you could get uh, retaliated. And you know what? Satan had, Satan had it right. <laughs> Satan said, skin for skin, a man will do anything to protect his own skin. Well, we have to stop that. We have to speak truth no matter what. Yeah. And the issue is we got, a, we got a culture and we've got politicians now and we have an administration and we have a godless administration that is operated by a godless party and more that are saying, Israel's not that big of a deal anymore. Mm -hmm. Doctrines of demons in the last days. We're, we're living the last days passages out. And let me just expound upon what is enabling this agenda. What is enabling this agenda is what Pastor Jack just touched on. Fear. Fear to speak truth. And that's what the labeling is about. Because if you challenge critical race theory, you're a racist. But actually what they're doing, they're promoting a racist ideology that is dividing America based upon historic racism. They are, you know, Martin Luther King talked about, Martin Luther King Jr. talked about a... a a world, a country in which his children would be judged by the content of their character. Sixty years later, mm. we now have those walking, apparently uh, claimed in his footsteps, that are judging people by the color of their skin and not the not content the of their character. That's right. And that's the party that is advancing this. The, the Democratic Party has been taken over by leftists. Now, you cannot be surprised by any of the actions that this administration has taken if you actually read their party platform. That's right. This is the most radical Democratic Party that has ever set foot in leadership positions. 
the whole idea of forcing, and this is the first time, I hope you're paying attention to the president's budget that he introduced, yeah. which is going to fund more of this radical education in our public schools, but it's also for the first time since 1976, removed that common ground of not forcing Americans to fund abortion. That is no longer there, and this administration in four months yep has opened the floodgates to almost a half a trillion dollars to fund abortion and abortion-promoting entities. Elections have consequences, and they are moving quickly to solidify their power, and a lot of it is being accomplished by spreading fear among those who would challenge them. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you, we must challenge what we know to be evil. Mm. Tony, Jesus said, therefore by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's amazing to me that they did all these things, and they thought they were doing it in the name of God, and Jesus says on the day of judgment, he's going to say to them, I don't even know who you are, and he's going to consider all that they did lawlessness, and what's amazing to me, don't answer, please, I'm, I'm serious, this is a night... You know, I know that we're streaming right now and we're everywhere right now, but I'm, I'm, I don't care. You're here, and we're about making stronger believers and, like Tony said, equipping you. So I'm just going to speak to you, okay? So don't raise your hand. Don't do anything. But God's word says, defend life. Speak up for those who are sentenced to crushing, to, to being destroyed. Don't answer, but... Who was he speaking to when he said that? When God said, defend those who cannot defend themselves, who was he speaking to? Well, I, I, can, tell you, I can tell you who he wasn't speaking to. He wasn't speaking to the unbelievers. He was speaking to the believers. So then you ask the question, who are the believers? And I could say right now, you are all, we are, the believers. But then what makes up the believers? You. So am I speaking up for the unborn that are destined to be crushed? Next thing is this. God says, he commands us, comfort my people Israel. Mm -hmm. He speaks that to the Gentile nations, right? So don't, re don't, don't respond, but what are you doing? What are you saying to protect the unborn? And what are you doing? What are you saying to defend Israel? Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, which a lot of people miss, he says that when he separates the nations, like a shepherd separates sheep from the goats, notice what the criteria is. The criteria of judgment will be how we treated his brethren. He says, as, as, as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, he's not talking about fellow Christians. He's talking about the Jews. So the Jews aren't going to go away. In fact, they become a talking point by which people are defined. The moment you say, well, uh, black power, white power, whatever, rainbow power, you're alienating everybody else. That's why I told you guys recently in Boston how I was incredibly offended that with letter fonts probably 30 feet high at Fenway Park, it says, Black Lives Matter. And I was offended. Because that sign, what is that sign for? That's, are you, is that sign supposed to be educating me that black lives matter? I'm not stupid. Of course black lives matter. But then I thought, if I was black, I would be offended by that sign. It implies that I don't know that my life matters, and so I need to speak up about my life, because apparently people don't know that my life matters. It, it, it communicates that the black community is somehow not smart enough to figure that out. That offends me. If there was a sign that said white lives matter, I'd be offended at that. 
Do you hear what I'm saying? But we need to be careful because we need to stand and speak up. And we do that by getting involved in the PTA, school board, getting involved and finding out what's happening. But something's got to be done. I, I, and I have to end with this. It's, I lamented. Did you see the news tonight of that precious, big, beautiful grandpa, that, the black man whose granddaughter was shot dead in Minneapolis? And it turns out, I didn't know this, but it was the third child killed in three weeks in Minneapolis by shootings of black-on-black black crime. And you know, did you guys, anybody see the news? You know why you didn't see it? Because it was on Newsmax only. Greg Kelly was interviewing the grandpa, and the grandpa said, you know what's wrong? A white man kills a black man, and thousands of people terrorize a community and burn down businesses, and all the news covers it. He says, a black man kills a black kid, and it doesn't even make the headlines. This is the grandpa saying this. Something's wrong. Listen, when you start picking sides, you're wrong. And we need to judge ourselves as to where are we in these last days. Are we disciples of Jesus, which means we're making an impact in the culture, we're loving people, including our enemies, we're doing everything we can. I understand that abortion's being funded by the Biden administration now big time. But you know what? Locally, are you guys keeping a pulse on what's happening locally with abortion? In our area, abortion is on the ropes, man. Abortion clinics are hurting because, because people are praying and people are getting involved and people are scooping up these pregnant moms and taking care of them and paying doctor bills. And that's awesome. That's the answer. The answer is not in the government. The answer is among people who care and love, and by doing that, Jesus, Jesus is pleased. And Tony mentioned by, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's keeping his commandments, is loving your neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Everyone's your neighbor. It's pretty awesome. We just need to think, get our minds going. My mind's going 100 miles an hour trying to gonna, keep up with you. I'm going to sit down. I'm, I'm going to sit down. Keep me from talking. I, I do want to just, a little footnote to what you said about abortion in the country. It is true that the Biden administration, this administration, is doing all that it can to facilitate, expand, and fund abortion. But it's not doing it without resistance, because what is mm -hmm. happening across the states in the nation, in fact, uh, we've seen more pro-life legislation passed in the last decade than in the previous 30 years combined. Now, let me tell you where we stand right now. One of the reasons they're so frantic, and, and you may have heard this in the campaign where Joe Biden said, I want to codify Roe v. Wade into law. What he was admitting there is that Roe v. Wade, abortion, is not the law of the land. It was a judicial decision that everybody has played along with. And now they're afraid the court is going to overturn that and bring it back to the states, which there is now a case out of Mississippi that is before the Supreme Court that this time next year, the issue of abortion could go back to the states and the vast majority of states will outlaw abortion in their borders. Now that means that America will once again be a predominantly pro-life nation. We will have repented of abortion. It's not just enough to pray repentance. Repentance means turning and going the other way. And we're on the verge. We must not lose heart That's right. in where we stand today. But back to this topic of the critical race theory, of the wokeness, this unfortunately has gotten a foothold in the church. Oh, yes. And you see churches that are adopting the whole, uh, the, the phrases and the terms and embracing Black Lives Matter and all of the ideology that goes with it. 
the church is being divided by this. And we need to realize, and the message of the church is, is just as, as uh, Paul told the Galatians, he said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither <laughs> slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. This is why we must speak up, because the church should and can model what unity looks like. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to be doing that. And, and some would say, well, okay, but then why are you talking about racist things? You don't bring unity by ignoring the truth. The truth is what brings That's unity. It. Amen. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Think about that for a moment. Let's have unity. Wait, I have to stand. I interrupted you. <laughs> Let's have unity. Peace, love. Around what? What's our agreement? What's our platform? What's our purpose? Well, just to get along. It's impossible. Because if you have two people, you'll have five opinions. Right? <laughs> truth is the only thing that causes unity. Don't ever think that unity it creates the atmosphere for truth. It's opposite. Truth causes unity. And we've been, we've been conditioned in the church to, if you're a good Christian, conflict will not come your way. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, I don't like conflict, actually. Um, and, you know, we're just conditioned to avoid conflict and that if there's trouble around you, then you're probably doing something wrong. Well, the opposite is true. If there's not conflict in your life as you're following Jesus Christ, you have to really question, are you following Jesus in an authentic manner, as the Scripture says? Now, again, and I want to underscore what Pastor Jack said earlier. We're speaking the truth. We're speaking it in love. Our heart compels us to speak not so we can win a debate and see, say, see, I told you so. Right. We are compelled to speak the truth out of a love for our fellow, fellow human being that they too might come to know the truth, be set free, and enjoy the abundant life that Amen. Jesus has gained yep. for us. Yep. Yeah, uh, John said uh, in Third John, uh, no greater joy than I have than to have or to see my children walk in truth. It's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to keep up with you, so I got all these notes. I got to follow up to the points you made. I'm just getting started. Well, I'm just going back to where you first started, but <laughs> you said something earlier, and I want, to, I, want to un, I want to just put a big exclamation point on it. You said you can't wait until you get in that moment to decide what you're going to do. Mm. All of us as believers are going to have our day of testing. It's going to come. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, go ahead and write this down. What is today? The 2nd of June? Mm -hmm. June 2nd, 2021. There will come a day when I'm going to be tested. Mm -hmm. Now, I was just reading. We're, we're leading our, our organization and our, a lot of our followers. Some of you may be a part of this. We're doing a two-year journey through the Bible. And recently we read in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 3, reading about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you know, you know they, they refused to bow, they refused to yield to the cultural winds of that day, and they were stood on the, the plain there of Dura, and they, they refused to bow to the great big 90-foot golden statue. And remember, they were ushered in before the king, and he said, you know, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to strike up the band, and uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to hear again from the Babylonian beetles. And if you don't bow... <laughs> right. If you don't bow, there's the furnace. Think about it. And they said, King, we don't even need to think about it. That's right. Why? You go back to chapter 1 and you realize why. When the three of them and Daniel decided in their hearts that they would not stray from God awesome. and enjoy the delicacies of the king. Yeah. You see, they made up their mind a long time ago who they were going to serve. And so we need to make up our mind right now who we will serve. When, when the knock comes at the door or the boss calls you into the office or the editorial is written about you or, or whatever the case may be, depending on your station in life, you need to have already made your decision that this is where you stand. I've committed myself to following the Lord Jesus Christ 
And I can do nothing else but stand mm -hmm. firm on his word. I will not deny my Lord and Savior. Yep. Now, Jesus said, uh, beware when all men speak well of you. I should be in good shape. <laughs> Think about that. It's bizarre because um, it's so incredibly true. And then what do we do with that as a culture is we want to monitor how many likes we have yeah. on our social media. And Jesus told us right there, watch out. Watch out for how many likes you have. <laughs> you don't want to have many likes. But you don't, of course, you don't want to go around being a, a you know, cold-hearted, crazy person either, you know? But um, I remember meeting uh, Tony, and then shortly after that, uh, meeting up with, uh, I met you here in the foyer, actually. Yeah, well, one of our first gatherings of pastors like 18 years ago was out there, right after, you, well, maybe 17 years ago, right after you built the building. Yeah. And so, um, so shortly after that, I was in his office in D.C., and he had been, I don't know if you remember this, but you said, you know... If you hang out with me, you're probably going to get in trouble. <laughs> and it's so true. Every pastor that hangs out with Tony winds up getting in trouble. <laughs> and it's, it's the good, good kind of trouble uh, to have. Um, but as parents, as grandparents, we need to be so very careful. We need to be very attuned of what our kids are being taught. Yeah. I didn't have the heart to show you. I have to just think about it some more. But I was sent um, some of the uh, curriculum uh, regarding LBGT, I didn't, can't even keep up now with the acronyms, LBGTQ, and now there's more yeah. to that, that is, uh, it's a video series that's being shown to public school children, uh, cartoon, um, and it's just, abs I mean, it just made me sick, because, and again, please, man, I, I, I just, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and I just, I feel like I'm beating my head against the wall. You guys are fine. You guys are fine. I'm going to say it. You guys are fine. I get the biggest pushback with what I'm about to say from pastors. And it's this. If we would just stop dividing our area of influence to, um, I'm a Christian, so I, I'll be a witness at church, but nowhere else. Well, we don't need your witness at church. We need you to get fueled up so you go out and be a witness. So... So doing that, what we need, what we need is us to divorce ourselves from this thing Well, we don't get involved in, in the world. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, in another version of Christianity. Right. We're supposed to get involved in the world. He told us don't love the world, but you got to go into the world to save the world. You got to go in the world to give them light. And so when we have churches that are being taught, you don't need to register to vote. That's for the lost. You don't need to get involved. You don't need to run for mayor. That's for pagans. That's exactly how we got to where we're at. Yep. Somehow we bought this bill of goods, which I think is a big fat lie that we're Christians. We don't, we don't go into Hollywood if you remember, Hollywood used to be governed by a bunch of Christians. Did you know there was the Hollywood Christian Club and Roy Rogers was the president? There used to be a standard in movies that the community of Hollywood wouldn't allow. Okay, but then Christians got their feelings hurt and they, they moved out. We need to get back into that stuff. We need to get back into radio. We need to get back into music. We've abandoned the cultures to the evil one. And I think the last bastion now, the church is being abandoned to the world. The church is given up to the world. And you know that you say, Jack, that's harsh. Really? How many people, maybe you're here, how many people have now come to me over the last three weeks and they've said, Pastor, you told us that once our church that we came from opened their doors, we'd go back. So we went back. And the first, I'm not kidding, the first sermon our pastor gave with the reopening of the church is that we need to apologize for being white. Yep. They packed up, they moved right back here. <laughs> right? Tony says it's infiltrated the church. Boy, has it. And we need to stand in the truth. We need to know what the Bible says. 
And that comes just by reading it. And you don't have to make it difficult. Read it. Just read it. Watch what happens. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, well, we've got some resources available for you. We just launched last week the Center for Biblical Worldview. The reason for that is to help believers understand these issues from a biblical perspective. You know, really, I appreciate your opinion. I hope you appreciate mine, but in the end, it doesn't matter. It's not our opinion. It is the truth. Amen. And, and a, a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, needs to know how to combine his faith, her faith, with their public walk, to integrate your faith into what God has called you to do in this world. It is important, the work that you do. God is about calling us, and it can be, you can be a teacher, you can be an accountant, you can be a doctor, you can be a bus driver. God calls us into that to be witnesses for him mm. and to operate with our faith, by our faith, with the strength of our faith. We don't check our faith at the door of whatever our profession is, which is what the world wants us to do. And so our Center for Biblical Worldview, in fact, if you'd like to find some of the resources, you can text, uh, you can write this down, text WORLDVIEW to 67742. That's WORLDVIEW to 67742. And just uh, last week, we also announced one of our senior fellows is Dr. Owen uh, Strand, who is um, actually just writ, wrote a book on wokeness and critical race theory. It'll be out uh, next mm. month, and uh, he's one of our senior fellows in doing some of our work on our biblical worldview. So we're helping Christians understand these issues through the lens of Scripture, which I think is extremely important. And along those lines, I want to just read, uh, actually from today's reading, I want to read one verse from Ezra. We're in Ezra in our two-year journey through the Bible. Ezra, as he goes back, uh, you, you probably know the story, he goes back um, to complete the, the, the temple had been built, but they were still in disarray. He goes back and he's shocked. He's astonished because they were doing the same thing that their forefathers had done. They had intermarried with the pagans. They were engaged in idolatry once again, and he was, just, he, he was just shocked by what he saw. And he reads, he, he says this in chapter 9, verse 8, he says, now he, he brought them together to repent and to lead them to a commitment to be sanctified and set apart for God. He says, and now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. You see, mm. I believe that today in America, we don't know it, but our children have been carried away captive. Yeah. They've been carried away captive through our education system, through entertainment, and, and we're wondering why things are not working, why the walls are broken down, the, the spiritual walls of protection of our nation and of our families are broken down. And we're wandering around thinking, well, how did this happen? What's mm -hmm. going on here? And the reality is we have turned our back on the truth of God. And, and what he is saying here is, it's, this is not to the, to the broader world, but it is to those Jews, in this case, the spiritual application for us is as believers. We need to realize where we are and why we're here. Yeah. And we need to take responsibility. If Ezra does something that Daniel did and Nehemiah did, he prayed for the people, but he identified with the sins of the people. You see, the church, we're in the same boat. And we need to not be accusing someone over there or, or that denomination or this mm -hmm. denomination. What we need to realize is that the church has lost its salt. It's no longer having the preserving effect because we are not committed to following the truth of God. Mm -hmm. But here's the hope in this message. As they turn back to God, enlighten our eyes. I believe our prayer should be, Lord, show us your truth. He, in fact, yeah. Jesus said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit to lead you into the understanding of all truth. And, and as he does that, give us a measure of revival in our bondage. Mm. 
You know, we, we, we want to celebrate our freedom, but I will tell you, we are living in a cultural captivity. It's true. And we have been like so many of those children of Israel, the, the Jews at this point, so many of them stayed in Babylon. They were happy there. That's good. And they were given their freedom to go back and rebuild the temple and d develop their independence once again, but they were so comfortable in bondage. God, give the church in America Amen. a revival even in the midst of this cultural captivity. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well said. But it's going to take each of us in our homes, taking responsibility for our own homes, for our children, our grandchildren. It's going to take us taking responsibility for our communities. It's going to take pastors that are willing to pastor beyond the walls of their church to pastor their communities like Calvary Chapel has been doing. And as Jack mentioned, we're promoting and encouraging parents to run for local school boards. Absolutely. That is one of the most critical points right now because if we hope to, Lord tarries, if the Lord tarries, we hope to turn the future of this country, it starts right now in the elementary mm -hmm. classrooms where these children are being taught to hate America. Yep. And so parents need to run for school board. Businessmen need to get behind them. They need to run for school board, need to run for city council, state legislature. Now is not the time to go into the woods and hide. You know, if you want to prep for something, prep for the return of Christ by being obedient today, living for him. Okay, I've said everything I need to say. That's good. You guys want to get ready for some uh, Q&A, uh, if you guys would do that. And listen, here's, what we're gonna, here's the rules for Q&A. It's going to be over here somewhere. But um, we have to stop at 8.30. We just have to stop. It's not going to be personal if, if we... You know, we cut you off, or it's not personal. Uh, we just have to keep to a, a time schedule tonight. Wow, that was profound and profoundly said about our children being in captivity, because as soon as Tony said that, I thought, oh my goodness, that is so true, because none of us in here feel the, the freedoms that we, that we enjoyed a year ago. And I'm not just talking about mask or no mask. I'm talking about, you don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that word. Okay, so today, today I was at Wahoo's where all Christians go for lunch. <laughs> and in my mind, you know what? I mean, just crazy, right? In my mind, I had ordered two fish tacos. And this is what I do. I say, yep, two 1988 style fish tacos and make that black and white. Black rice, uh, black beans, white rice. And as soon as I said black and white, my mind went to, I wonder, I wonder if that offends somebody. But it can't offend anybody, except somebody who's not black or white. Because they said black and white. This is going on in silent in my head while I'm ordering the food. Why? Because we live in a culture that the, the, the airwaves have been charged with, you don't say a word. You just sit down and you take it. And you know what? That works in every country in the world, but it's not supposed to work in America. Because we're supposed to be independent thinkers. And we're supposed to have enough cultural integrity that if somebody disagrees with us, we celebrate the fact that they can disagree with us instead of slapping them or arresting them. But think about how much, his, uh, what Tony said about captivity, how much we are in captivity. We have to tell kids, now don't say that. Oh, don't do that. Can't play army. Oh, boys, boys, stop playing, stop playing cowboys and Indians. That's offensive. Man, I'm glad I grew up when I grew up because we played, we played G.I. Joe and we played stuff and my goodness, Cops and robbers? Cops and robbers, absolutely. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, all that stuff. We, we played uh, cowboys and Indians. And we would flip coins to see who was going to be the Indian today and who was going to be the cowboy. Nobody got offended. Nobody sat in the corner and sucked their thumb in the fetal position <laughs> over the trauma that it caused. But we live in a bizarre age because we've been beaten down into submission.
Yeah, the only trigger I knew was on my cap gun. Oh, absolutely. Um, but we have to, listen, we have to reclaim freedom. We have to reclaim freedom. And, and, and listen, before we get into the Q&A, Q &A, Tony said it earlier, everybody's afraid of being labeled a racist. That's, listen, that's only possible if you allow yourself to be intimidated. You know, you have to let them do that to you. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? I'm, I'm, please, please, I want to encourage you. When somebody, part of, the, part of their action is to project a label onto you. Because the depth of their argumentation is about this deep. So, but they know it. So what they do is they frame it and they box you in before they get going because they have a very, very low tide. Okay? So you can say something and they'll say, you're a racist. Well, you know what? That doesn't work if you're not a racist. Yeah. Right? I refuse. I just, they can't label me that because I know that I'm not. And the moment that they do that to you, if you get quiet about that, then you, you've handed it to them. You, you can't do that, especially yeah. those of you who are in college. You can't and if they that. get up in your face, say, don't you social distance? <laughs> That's good. Yes. Hello, Pastor. Thank you for taking our questions. Um, one of the things that I've been wondering about is, you know, you're asking parents to be part of um, the school boards, but what do you, what advice do you give teachers that are in the front lines of the oh. battlefield, um, where like I teach science and saying that there's two genders is not, which is a scientific fact, is not looking very good, and it's just like, what, wow. what do we do? What, are there resources? How do we just communities? What? How do we just you know? Yeah, you know, f f I can't answer your question in broad extent because what I want to do is answer it to the core. The core is, and I love what she just said, First Timothy six twenty about science. She is being faced with the dilemma to embrace a lie or to embrace the truth. The wokeness is imposing that upon her. The wokeness is demanding that she pretend the emperor's got clothes on. Is that how it goes? That they pretend he's got clothes? They're asking her to pretend that their position has clothes when it doesn't. She's a science teacher. Translation, she's a teacher of truth. Immutable truth, science, doesn't change. They're asking her to change it. They've divorced themselves from logic and reason. They become irresponsible and willfully ignorant. And they want her to do the same thing. She's, listen, I'm not on the front line. She, others like her, and law enforcement, they're the ones on the front line. Because her freedom is directly being boxed in and sequestered and taken away. My answer to you is this. You have to speak truth. You have to speak truth. You see, yeah, but I'm going to get, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get fired. You know what? You might get fired by a woke district. Here's the thing: if you get fired for speaking the truth, okay, then God, God is highly, highly responsible to find you a better job, and He will. He'll, he will do that. Let me. Um... Let me just speak to that. In the last two weeks, I've spoken to two teachers. In fact, tonight, I talked with another teacher. Last night, I had another teacher. Two different school districts, two different states that spoke out on this at public uh, comment sessions at the school board. One, uh, you look at, his name is Jonathan Copel. His went viral. It was like three million views of, of what he had to say, just calling out the foolishness that they were doing. And that was in my home state of Louisiana. You know, they, they uh, look at him odd uh, because he spoke out, but teachers, he told me tonight, he said, teachers come by and said, hey, thanks for speaking up. I appreciate you speaking up. Um, another teacher, actually, who, who attends at Calvary Chapel uh, Church in Leesburg, Virginia, he was put on administrative leave after he spoke up. Mm -hmm. We don't know what will happen, but both of them are confident in the stand that they took because they spoke truth. 
and their churches are rallying around them. And this I do know, because I've experienced myself, as Jack said, if man shuts one door, God will open another yeah, yeah, for his people. Yeah. And, um, and I believe that her issue that she's having to cope with, I believe that's part of the doctrines of demons. Uh, so there was recently an um, article from the Gateway Pundit um, about a reporter, uh, Maggie Haberman, saying that President Trump is going around saying that he's going to be reinstated uh, by August. Um, is there, you know anything about that? Is there any truth to that? Uh, I know there's recounts going on. Is that even possible? No. No way. No, I don't, I, I don't see that. And I don't see a way. I, there's a lot of things out there. Internet's a great thing sometimes. Um, but there's a lot of stuff out there that's just not, not true. And, and so the election is over. It's over. There were, as I talked about last time I was here, there were election irregularities, which is why 48 states have introduced almost 400 bills to fix many Thank of the God. problems that surfaced in the November election. Yeah. But even those audits are not going to change what happened in November, but it will protect what happens in the future, and it's why it's important. Yeah, amen. Know. Right on. That's true. Thank you for taking my question. I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, since America changed guards, we have a new president. And you've seen how downhill our United States is going very rapidly. What, is, what do you think about now Israel? Hmm. They're going to have a new prime <clears throat> minister. And I think the same spirit mm -hmm. that got this 46 elected mm -hmm. is the same yeah. radical mm -hmm. in Israel. And now, if they're going to be on the same page, what do you think the United States' relation with Israel now? Because they're going to, they have the same mind frame, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tony. You're the Israel expert. I would, uh, <laughs> my answer would be that you, when you read in Scripture, in fact, I was having this conversation with my kids last week, when you read in prophecy where Israel stands alone. Yes. I think it's because of the... the, the America, without the influence of believers, will not stand with Israel. And it's important that, you know, in Congress we have believers that will, will stand firm with Israel, and there are many... But I, I don't think that at the, at the end of the day, the Biden administration would stand with Israel even if there is a closer mindset with the ruling party in Israel. Yep. I mean, look, you, you make a good point. I mean, look what's happening right now. I was just ha talking to t this afternoon on my radio program with a member of Congress uh, from Texas who was leading a delegation on the border of uh, the southern border. And, and, and it is chaos on the border. I don't know if you saw that viral clip that went of a five-year-old that was just dropped off in El Paso at the border, and he's screaming, holding his teddy bear, don't leave me. This is happening, and this is supposed to be compassionate policy that this administration is promoting. I took, remember, Jack, I took you down to the border yeah. about a year and a half ago. Can I just insert something you said, because I don't want it to be wasted? Yep. The five-year-old being dropped off with his teddy bear and the kid in a total life-changing forever panic, that's happening now, many of you have fallen for Obama's lie. He keeps saying it about the cages, the cages. This is happening now. It didn't happen under Trump because he shut all that stuff down, and we saw it with our own eyes. We went down there, okay? Let's remember something. Cages? Cages were built by Barack Obama. You're not being told that, Okay? And so when Tony mentions what's happening right now, I don't know what you need to do. Either you need to find a new news source, that's hard, or maybe you just need to take a drive down there and get as close as you can. You've got to see what's happening because it is, it's sick. They've apprehended more people coming across the border in the last four months than they did the entire last year. When we were down there in the border about a year and a half ago, it was like a ghost town. Why? Because the Trump policies were working. You look at what's happened just in the last three weeks. We've had a cyber attack on the Colonial Pipeline. 
gas shortages, gas prices spike. We just had a cyber attack on meat packing plants, and there's going to be a shortage of beef, and the price, I'm sure, is going to go up. We just saw, as Jack made reference to, one of the most uh, volatile times in Israel that we've seen in, in two decades. Is it a coincidence that this happened when, when uh, Joe Biden and his administration was firmly settled in the White House? You remember when Donald Trump moved the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and we, oh, this is going to create rioting. This is going to create all kinds of havoc. And then we saw him recognize the sovereignty of Israel over the Golan Heights, and we, oh, this is going to create all kinds of havoc and violence. <laughs> Guess what happened? They actually entered into peace accords with countries in the Middle East like the UAE. Yep. yep. Strength brings about peace. Weakness brings about chaos and confusion. Do you guys, uh, for those of you who are watching right now, you're not aware of this stuff, or maybe that, that you're here in the, in the audience, uh, you do know, right, because of what Tony just mentioned? Um, in fact, I'll set you up. For the previous four years, how much did you hear of ISIS? How much did you hear about ISIS? How much did you hear about Al-Qaeda? Or the Taliban? You know what Trump, Trump said to the generals? Do whatever you guys do. Just go do it. There was one of Trump's advisors regarding the relocation of the embassy who advised President Trump regarding his campaign promise to relocate the embassy to Jerusalem. That person, that advisor told President Trump, I don't have enough, armed, I don't have enough military forces to prevent World War III from happening if you do that. Instead, Trump received numerous nominations of Nobel Peace Prizes. Did you know that? Over what's happened in the Middle East. That's all gone now. Because weakness, if you're from the Middle East, you know exactly what I'm going to say. Weakness breeds violence. If you're strong, no one, no, one's, no one acts up. And you need to remember that. So regarding her question, I don't know where we're going to be with Israel, but I do know what the Bible says. Eventually, all nations will forsake Israel. The Bible says so. And sadly, that includes America. We say, oh, well, goody, goody, we're so close to Bible prophecy. That's a weird approach <laughs> for you to have. No. So voting matters. It really does. Thoughts on right and left extremists? I would like to know your thoughts wow, okay. about that. If you asked that question 10 years ago, I would have known what you meant. But now I have to ask you, what's a left extremist and what's a right extremist? Because I'm a right-wing uh, extremist, apparently. Because last Monday was Memorial Day. And I put a gigantic American flag on my garage door because it was Memorial Day. I... So I, what do you mean? What do you mean by extremists? I thought it was just a long weekend. Ooh. Yes, if you're from California, it was just a long weekend. But we stayed cool. What do you mean on the extremists talking about like Black Lives Matters, Antifas, conservatives, patriots, Trump supporters, Christians? What are your thoughts on that? I, uh, my thoughts are this. Um, I looked... Just per, I'm only speaking for me. So in the last, in the previous election, and not the last election, the election before that one, um, I decided uh, in choosing to vote that Hillary Clinton had her worldview and that she was going to implement, number one, killing babies. Number one for Trump is that he was going to defend pro-life, the unborn baby. So I weighed out the tweets versus the Clintonian eras of power. I knew her voting record. I didn't know his, because he had never been in power before. Looked at his family, listened to some of the things that his wife had to say. So I voted for Trump, yes. okay? So that makes me an extremist in the eyes of people who didn't vote for Trump. Uh, I'm pro-life, that makes me an extremist. In fact, the Southern Poverty, po Southern Poverty Law Center holds Tony and I as extremists because we're pro-life 
And you know what? If you are defining patriots, such as those who are like Sam Adams or George Washington, or um, Jonathan Mayhew or Jonathan Witherspoon, then I'm a patriot, you see? So it depends on how you define it. Um, and let me, let me say this, even though you didn't even solicit this. If you are a patriot based upon CNN's definition, then all of you were in the Capitol building on January 6th. <laughs> but they're actually idiotic. They really are idiotic. Because now, when, you, when I look at that group that's in there running around, who infiltrated a building that if you've ever been there, just getting near the building in your right mind, is reverence. It's amazing. And then for people to knock down doors and go through and go, that's scary. That's, those are crazies. Those are extremists. Those are radicals, right? But am I, when I see, when I see um, an American flag, that blesses my heart because I know that without what that flag stands for, there never would have been a, a and, um, and there never would have been the abolishment of slavery. When I see that flag, there never, listen, without that flag, all of Europe would have been speaking German tonight. Without that flag, half of the United States would probably be speaking Japanese tonight. So some people would say, you're an extremist. I guess if their worldview is different than mine, then they, they feel comfortable labeling that labeling me that. I love our nation's founding. I know you do too, and I love our history. If we would just study it, I, I just, uh, that a country of ours would go to war with itself and experience its biggest bloodbath of all of its wars when brothers killed brothers that black people would be free. This is the last nation on the earth that should ever be griping about racism. First of all, thank you, Tony and Jack, for standing up for our nation. Um, across the nation, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm touched when I watch your videos you. online, et cetera. Um, my question is, this is regarding education. You mentioned education, and that's the very reason why I came tonight, because I have worked for three secular jobs where they let me go. Um, and. I realized I cannot work in secular jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I tried um, conservative jobs, uh, even with politicians, local politicians and congressmen, uh, doing internships and volunteer. My computer is compromised. I know this, and my phone has been compromised. I'm on unemployment, so as I further try to finish my education, getting my transcripts has been the dilemma and it's with the public school. I'm trying to go into mm -hmm. conservative education um, with like Liberty as an example. Mm -hmm. um, I've been through the whole process, completed my application, and I'm stumbled, so. And, and the question you're asking is what? Education, how do, I, how do I complete my education so I can further my position in public policy or legislature. How do you complete your education in a, in a specific area you want to pursue? I don't have a bachelor's degree. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Does anyone know how to answer her question here in California? How does that work? She wants to complete your education. Right, because I want to be involved in public policy and legislature. Yeah, um, it, this is my, you, that's a, I think you can answer this well. Personally, though, for me, when you say you want to get an education so that you can make a difference in public policy, okay, depending upon what area you want to make a difference in public policy, then certain degree, a degree or degrees would be great benefit. So you would want to look to where you want to land. Do you want to land working for, like, you know, the governor's office or the senator's office or the president's office? That's going to dictate your pursuit. On the other side of the spectrum... Your goal is to make an effect, right? Well, I look around at what you guys are doing through real impact. I mean, look, right now, Gina Gleason is somewhere in this nation making a difference because she's speaking 
at gatherings on how to affect your local community. She's educating them. But she was a mother 20 years ago who said, I'm going to get involved. She's self-taught. And now she's the one being consulted by states and other ministries and, and politicians on how, to act, on, on how to get community going. So it depends on where you want to land in your pursuit. I started in 1990, well, um, well, I started getting involved as a mother, 20, uh, let's see, I quit work in uh, 1996, so 1996, like a career job, um, is when I started getting involved in um, politics as a mother, holding a ba an infant. Yeah, so well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of institutions online now that you, if you want to get a, a degree in political science, public policy, there's a lot, Liberty University, I did my undergraduate work there, Regent University, Michelle Bachman is the uh, dean of the School of Government there now. But I think the bigger issue, yes, Michelle's great, she's uh, our board <laughs> chair, chairman, she is a fighter. Here's the bigger thing, and I have a people, a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, I really want to do this, I want to do that. And my question is always the same, is what does God want you to do? And, and I think that's where we've got to start. Because I actually never wanted to be in politics. Um, I, I wanted to be a police officer. That's all I ever wanted to do. And I was able to do it until I was ushered out because I took a stand against the way they abused pro-lifers and my police career ended uh, when Operation Rescue came to town and, and uh, the Lord opened another door for me and here I am. Um, but the reality is we need to set our eyes on serving the Lord and he will provide the platform. Yep. You know, if, if the Lord told me, Tony, I want you to serve me on your front porch, guess where I would be? I would be on my front mm -hmm. porch. Um, and maybe someday I'll sit on my front porch. I don't know. <laughs> but there is no better place to be in the entire world mm. where the Lord wants you to be. And yeah, so, so seek the Lord until you have that clear so direction. You guys, um, we're going to go super fast. We've got two minutes. Lightning round. So very fast. Next. Really quick. We've got to get two minutes. Fast, this fast. for uh, Mr. Perkins. And stuff. Mr. Perkins. Yeah. Yeah, regarding, uh, you said for taking back the school council, you know, school boards and city councils and everything like that, for people looking for information on how to set up stuff like finance committees and stuff like that and basically trying to run for office themselves, how would we go about doing that so we could take back our offices? Good question. Uh, we're actually working on a program right now at the Family Research Council. Uh, you can email us at uh, frc.org, go to the website. And uh, we are uh, focusing primarily on school boards and putting together a program in which we'll do campaign training uh, of the candidates. And we're also building kind of an, an informal association of school board members because what I found out over the last five, so six good. years of working with school board members, there is no conservative organization supporting school board members. So check out the website, frc.org, and uh, email us, and we'll, uh, we'll get information back to you. That is awesome. Final one right here. Um, my question is for the school boards. Um, again, in the past, whenever we've gotten involved or we chose a homeschool or a charter, they still sneak in their agendas, and you see that unions are tied to it. Um, going up against unions seem to be pointless. Not pointless, but it's Hard. It's a lose-lose battle. They're so corrupt and deep. How do we work around the unions and make a difference? Have you ever played that game Whack-A-Mole? <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. It's, it's Whack-A-Mole. Um, you know, we, I used to think as a, as a Christian that when, uh, you know, something would happen, we would get up in arms and we would take action. We would go back to life as normal. Mm -hmm. This is life as normal. I mean, we are to be engaged, standing for the truth of God continuously, and we've got to be vigilant, knowing that because of our neglect, okay, because of the neglect of the church that has been on the sidelines allowing the cultural forces to drive our nation in the wrong direction, all of a sudden we realize how bad it is we've got to do something. It's going to take time to undo so much of this, because you're absolutely right. I battled 
the educational unions, the teacher unions, the educational establishment is one of the most powerful political establishments in any state and in na nationally. You've got to be persistent. You have to continue. You, you just cannot go into it with the idea that I'm going to clean this up and go home. You have to dedicate your life to standing for the truth in these arenas. And that's why for those that are called, you feel prompting. Here's what you'll feel, okay? If I can take just a minute, Jack. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a stirring, okay? I don't know how the Lord speaks to you, but I think generally he speaks as it. we're unsettled. We're, we have a passion that begins to build within us. And we're like Jeremiah. Our bones are going to burn up if we don't speak. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I got to the point where I just, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I feel like I'm about to blow up. And that's when he directed my steps. And so I believe that we just, if, if the Lord is stirring in your heart, you need to ask him, Lord, where do you want me to go? Mm -hmm. And then you just need to go. Yeah, and I want to add, I want to add in closing that, uh, yeah, they may have the millions and the, the megaphone, but, you know, we just learned recently, somebody might know where this was, where a, a school board would not listen to the parents. Arizona? Uh, tech, tech, it's the, actually happening in several places. And, and the, uh, the parents, the citizens who pay the, pay the way of all those people sitting up there on the throne, thrones, uh, deposed them, dethroned them right then and there in the spot. And what's my point? My, my point is that they may have the millions, but they don't have the parents' voice. And when parents are invited to rally... And I know the influence you have. You can do that. Where you can get parents together and educate them. Do you know this is what's going on? That in this, in this age of just sending out a tweet or a post and saying, if you care about what's happening to your kids in our district, I want to meet you at the corner of XYZ, and I want to, I want to rally some parents who care. Listen, when those parents show up at the school board, I'm going to tell you why it matters. It scares them to death. Here's the reason why. All they see is their political ambitions going up in smoke. Because most of them sitting there have an agenda to go somewhere else. And when parents show up, like many of you have done by the hundreds, yeah. and said, we're not going to have these, the, uh, the, we're not going to have bananas presented in our, in our kids' class and, parent, and teachers, teachers putting condoms on bananas in front of our kids. And so they don't. And that's what you need to do. You need to let the parents know, we're going to stand up against this. If you care, meet me at 7 o'clock at, at some place. And this is still America. And when you assemble that voice of the parent and they speak up, I don't know a school board that will not eventually bow because they, have, they, may, they may give up because they have strange ag agendas, but they'll give up. We just, our problem is we don't make noise. And yes, it's Christian to make noise. Just do it respectfully. Do it respectfully. But remember, you have the privilege. Oh, yes. That dirty word. Privilege. Well, we, need having... some, we need some Christian flash mobs at those school board meetings, you know? <laughs> Tweet it out. Hey, they know how to do it. So here's the thing, you guys. The privilege is you live in the United States. That's a privilege. Yes. It is still we the people. So we need to be we the people. Let's all stand. Listen, if you came here tonight, you need to hear this most importantly. Like Tony and I, you are a sinner. You have bad thoughts, you've had bad intent, you've had bad imagination, you've had <coughs> bad words. But Jesus Christ died on the cross to liberate you from the sin that controls your life. Amen. That's why the Bible is God's love letter written to you. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if you, whosoever, would believe that is trust in him now, that you would not perish, that is in hell, but have everlasting life, that's in heaven. Christ died on the cross for you and I, and he rose again from the dead for you and I. In Jerusalem today, it's Thursday there, there's an empty tomb. And he, God loves you, and that he wants you and his family forever, but you need to come to him. Tony mentioned those words earlier tonight. You need to repent. That is, change your mind about what you think about God and think his thoughts 
about him. And if you come to Christ, Jesus said he'll forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and that he'll set his seal upon you, and that he'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life. You can do that by simply following him tonight. Lord, we pray for Tony. We we pray for the great people at the Family Research Council. We ask you, Lord, to bless him as he heads back home, and God, that you'd watch over him and his family. And Father, that you would uh, galvanize him against the forces of darkness. There may be a lot of agendas afoot in Washington, D.C., but we know that the FRC is a target of the spiritual world of darkness. That the war that they fight is not on Capitol Hill exactly, but it's in the trenches and it's in the underworld, as it were, of darkness. So God, we pray that your favor, your grace, your abundance and generosity would be upon him and them. And Lord, go before all these tonight that have made the time to come. May tonight have made a difference in their discipleship to follow you, Jesus. That they'd count the cost and they'd say that I'll follow you, Lord. And Lord, that this culture that we live in, this, this, this two cities that this church property sits on, this county, our board of supervisors, our mayors, our city councils, our police departments, CHP, Father God, that you would show your grace and favor because this church is praying for them. Yes. 